So uh, welcome everyone to the person Centre Complex Care uh, theme meeting for the Arkfest, uh, both here in the room and on online. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is, is Pete Dixon, and one of my roles uh, within ARC is theme manager for the PCCC. Is that enough C's? Theme. Yeah, oh, I don't know. PC3 um, theme. So uh, here's the overview for today. What we're going to do is we've got a set of four presentations. Um, Given we are in a rugby league stadium, I thought it might be more uh, appropriate to have a set of six, but that um, having too many presentations just to justify a very weak and very niche joke that probably only Alan got, uh, it, was, it was probably a bit too much. So firstly, we're going to have uh, an introduction to our new PA co-lead, uh, Sandra Smith. Then we'll have a, a video from Isabel Leeson on the systematic project. Then um, for the seizures and epilepsy in nursing and care homes, we'll have a short video from one of our public advisors, Peter Lloyd, uh, followed by not Adam Noble. Adam couldn't be here today, unfortunately. He's at the graduation ceremony, so Tony will be talking to those slides. Then our other PA co-lead, Alan Griffiths, proudly sporting his St. Helens stop, uh, will be talking about the Denerex uh, project. Then we'll have a, a workshop around continuity and coordination of care and what data sets should we use. Um, and just before I go on as well, I uh, just want to mention that outside just outside in the, in the car park is from the Clinical Research Network, a, a bus, which we're encouraging people to, to visit, hopefully over lunch, don't walk out through uh, through this session. But if you, if um, uh, I've just been asked to, to mention that, so that's that's a Clinical Research uh, Network bus that I think the ARC has, has provided some funding for, so it'd be great if people could just go, thank you very much, in, into um, and see that later. So without further ado, sorry, Sandra, don't sit down, you're coming back up. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, here's an introduction to our, our new uh, public advisor co-lead, Sandra Smith, who's just going to tell you a bit about her background and experience. There you go. I was, I was going to do some slides, but I thought, no, we get always get um, overwhelmed by uh, PowerPoints. Um, Okay, so I'm a public advisor and I've recently become uh, involved as the co-lead with Alan uh, for PCCC. Um, so my involvement as a public advisor comes from a really very personal position. Um, I lost my husband to motor neuron disease and front temporal lobe dementia 13 years ago. And actually we spread his ashes over the rugby club out there because he was a, a fan. Um, and I also looked after my father who had multi-morbidities, heart, kidney, lung disease. Um, so I left my job in industry um, to become a carer. And then I said, no, I need to, to do something different. I need to be involved with research to improve quality of life for people. Um, but also about research so that we can implement and we can make changes. Um, and so I also then got involved with Clark because of MND and then because of dementia. And then myself, I was uh, diagnosed with something called SCAD, which is spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Yes, that's a mouthful. Um, and it gave, gave me more impetus to actually say there are so many diseases, there are so many multimorbidity that I need to get involved, involved. And then as a co-lead, particularly for PCC, um, because we're looking at multimorbidity, um, we're looking at, you know, social care and, and the environment. And we know that the NHS is changing drastically. Um, it's changing month by month. Um, we don't know what's going to happen next year. You know, we're probably going to have a general election. Um, so it's about research is really, really important. Um, and what I also say is that um, it's not just about me as a public advisor. It's not just about the researchers. It's about the members. It's about us all working in collaboration. And I think that is the most important message that, as the co-lead for PCC, that I want to get across to you. Because, um, I, I, you know, I look at some of the projects and I say, OK, we've got certain people are involved. But I know there's so much more expertise out there. There's so much more knowledge in all of us. Um, so my message to you is, yeah, you know, come and look at what PCCC does. Look, you know, what Tony does, what Pete does, Alan do, does, and myself. Um, and it's about sort of involvement. So I hope you learned something today. And I'm sure you'll have lots of questions over lunch. So, you know, any answers will come from the experts, because I'm only new, so bear with me. Um, and that's just a little bit about me and why I'm sort of a co-lead now. 
Someone do yourself down, Sandra, you're an expert as well. Um, so we're just going to move on now to um, the systematic uh, project, and we're going to have a, a short video about five minutes from uh, Isabel Leeson. Hi, I'm Isabel. Um, I'm a design researcher at the University of Liverpool, um, and I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the systematic project. Um, so Systematic is a collaboration between the University of Glasgow and the University of Liverpool and uh, it's about prevention, precision and equity by design for people living with multiple long-term conditions. So we know that the number of people with multiple long-term conditions is increasing and those with MLTC have poorer quality of life, greater care needs, higher risk of early death. And MLTC affect all communities, but we know that they disproportionately affect disadvantaged groups. And this is really relevant in Liverpool and Glasgow, where we have disadvantaged communities at high levels of MLTC. So our aim um, is to design an innovation hub for MLTCs called Systematic. And Systematic will help prevent MLTCs and improve care for people living with them equitably. Um, and this might involve researching and developing new technologies, services and systems for MLTC. At the moment, we're in the development phase, which means we're designing how systematic will work um, and what it will work on. And to do this, we need to identify and prioritise the key challenges and opportunities relating to MLTC prevention and management across health systems. Um, and there are really two key principles that guide this work. The first is that people with lived experience of MLTCs will be central to the development of systematic um, and have a say what it works on so that we can really make sure that it's going to address what really matters to them. And the second is that we really acknowledge the diversity and complexity of MLTCs and the health and care systems that involved in managing them. Um, and we know that we really need to understand these complexities to create a strategic and effective programme of work for systematic. At this stage, we're focusing on three key population segments relevant to MLTCs across the life course. Um, so the first is children and families, and this focuses on families with complex lives, uh, which can lead to health issues. And the second is working life, and this includes working age adults with MLTCs. And the third is pre-frailty. So this is older adults with MLTCs who are not yet defined as frail. And we're bringing together people with lived experience of MLTCs, health and care professionals, scientists, engineers, designers and social scientists to develop systematic. Um, and we're working across three working groups, which are called People Insights, Health Intelligence and Systems Futures. So the People in Science group focuses on people's lived experiences of MLTCs uh, and we're using approaches from design and social sciences to hear about people's experiences and ideas for systematic. And then the Health Intelligence group draws on health practitioners' knowledge and also health data to identify challenges and opportunities related to MLTCs. And then the Systems Futures Group gathers knowledge and evidence about how we can optimise, innovate and transition complex health and care systems. So we have 18 months to develop Systematic uh, and we're currently about six months in. And the process is split into five stages where at first, the three working groups work in parallel, developing their own subject specific knowledge relating to MLTC. Uh, and then all the groups come together in the last three stages to co-design systematic and the key things that it'll be working on. So that's a quick overview of systematic. Uh, in summary, we're developing 
an innovation hub for equitable prevention and management of multiple long term health conditions. And we're bringing together multiple stakeholders across disciplines, including data, system science, design and social sciences. And I've just popped a note at the bottom there, if there are any Liverpool organisations or communities that you think are relevant and we should speak to, please get in touch and let me know. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll just leave that up for a minute, just in case any of you do want to, to take uh, Isabel's uh, details there. I think I should point out um, that multi, um, multiple long-term conditions is a priority, one of our priority areas within person-centred complex care. And Isabel mentioned about the, the importance of using uh, public advisors to co-produce and be informed, uh, you know, use, use their lived experience to help with this. And that's something that really um, sits at the heart of what the ARC does. With our co-production with public advisors, we've got uh, over 100 uh, registered at the moment. We also have the Community Research Engagement Network, or, or the CORIN. Um, and uh, uh, the next thing that we're going to show is, is sort of a, a good example of this. So one of our public advisors who can't be here today, uh, Peter Lloyd, um, he came to us with an idea for a, for a project, which we've sort of taken and run with. So I'm going to show a, a quick video from Peter who will explain the genesis of of of, uh, of his idea from his lived experience and then tony will be speaking briefly about the, the project in, in in a little bit more detail so i shall queue up peter uh, now so it's not adam tony will be talking but here comes peter hopefully so um good day everybody um yes all this began uh, my wife had dementia for 13 years uh, it, it all began when after being in a care home for five of them she started to have regular seizures um toward the end of her time she died sadly uh six months ago uh the problem with that was that nobody in the care home had seen this kind of seizure before and most of the staff were completely overwhelmed by what they were looking at so what would normally happen is that the, the staff on duty would go ah and go 999 and then we get the blue flashing lights then we get the paramedics and the paramedics that go yeah woof. well i can't do it and then we get a trip to blackpool victoria hospital then we get a four-hour queue sitting in line waiting for someone to take an interest in us ros by the way was mute so everyone asked her are you all right love and she couldn't say a word and then at the end of that we get to the situation where she's admitted to different wards stroke wards heart wards and everybody She's there for a couple of days, but the damn thing was over within 15 minutes of us arriving, if not within 15 minutes of it happening. And when I put this into my good friends in Liverpool University, um, whom you'll be hearing from in a minute, they said, oh, that's interesting. So we called a meeting and people from all over the country came and said, yeah, we know this is a problem. So there you are, that's the story. Thank you to, to Peter there. So Peter came up with this idea and we, like you said, we um, had some uh, meetings and Tony will uh, give an overview of the outcome of what happened as a result of those meetings. Thanks. So, so that was a, a really kind of embarrassing nudge from, from Peter and that we, we think of ourselves as being an area of excellence, uh, uh, providing care for people with, with epilepsy, but we'd done uh, We'd, we'd done both UK and uh, European projects, which showed us actually the coordination of care was actually uh, pretty poor once you uh, once you move a very short distance away from centres that think that they're 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 excellent. And we'd also realised that um, we're very ageist in the way that we we uh, we uh, we manage things. And if we focus our services on young people, uh, then older people are going to get uh, a pretty raw deal. And what we know is our population is getting older. Our older brains are more susceptible to seizures. So people are actually more likely to have seizures when they're elderly than when they're children uh, these uh, these days. So. Uh, um, Adam Noble is, is at a graduation ceremony today, so unfortunately he couldn't be with us, so I'm, I'm going to speak to the slides that he's prepared. And Adam, Adam really, along with, with others, has, has, uh, has led on, on developing this, uh, this project. number of concerns that Peter um, uh, articulates, really. One is that uh, we've got vulnerable people in, in nursing homes, and they, in, in I Ideally, nursing homes are, are a place where there are staff in place uh, that can can look after people that have had seizures or had uh, medical problems, and yet they they end up on a kind of a, a revolving door problem uh, of heading to the uh, heading to the uh, emerge, uh, emergency department. So we've got a 
got, got a kind of a fundamental problem here and the, the people having seizures, they're not well managed in the nursing home, ambulances are called, people taken to hospital and not a lot's done. And they're in, they're in this kind of, um, of never ending circle and never actually real, uh, achieving an appointment with, with an expert that can actually uh, guide, uh, guide the management. So we, we realized this was a problem and we, we started off with some stakeholder meetings. So we brought together stakeholders, which had a Northwest focus, but we brought in people from, uh, from around the country using, using our, our connections. So hopefully you've spotted, we had people from um, geriatricians, we have paramedics, neurologists, care home managers, people from general practice, people from emergency medicine and, and, and nurse specialists, and all had insights to, uh, to, uh, to bring to this. So, and bottom line was that we we kind of articulated and agreed there was a really important problem that we need to 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 uh, to work on, and uh, uh, had a chat with one of the one of the charities that works in this area. They were willing to put up some cash. University of Liverpool were willing to to match that. So then we have uh, about thirty four k for a um, uh, a a project to just kind of do some initial work, and and, and clearly the aim then will be to to uh, use that to get funding for, for a, a much bigger program of work to uh, address. Was this your glass of water, Sandra? Yeah. <laughs> so the acronym was, was uh, uh, CHOM, and we've got a, 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 a dynamic set of slides which, are, which have got, got a number of animations on. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not guilty of that. So, so we wanted to work out, well, who? Uh, who are ambulances being called for? What, what are the characteristics of people? How often are ambulances being called? Uh, and, and how well are people being managed uh, when, when ambulances are called? And what is the cost of all this to, to, the, to the NHS? And what are the challenges that, that need to be addressed? And, and what are the solutions for those challenges? And so, so these were the sorts of things that we started to address in the, in the CHOM uh, project. Uh, and, and the first part uh, uh, about the who, the frequency the, and the management and the cost uh, has been dealt with by getting access to routine data that's been um, uh, collected by, uh, by ambulance services. Um, so we, we've been able to get access to routine data and analyze some of that to try and work out what is going on. And, and that bit of the project has been largely uh, completed and, and a statistician, I don't know whether Stephen Lane's here at the meeting today, so Stephen has, has led on, on the analysis of the, of the data. And then the second part is, is workshops and qualitative interviews with uh, uh, a range of stakeholders to try and work out what the solutions uh, to these challenges might, uh, might be. So the, the, the data tell us that, uh, yep, that there are lots of people attending the emergency department with seizures, and uh, there's a significant number of those are people from from nursing homes. One of the interesting things is that the the peak time for people attending from nursing homes is 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 different to the peak time for uh, for the general population. So the the black line on, on the on the graph on on the on the right hand side is uh, people from nursing homes, and there's a there's a there's a peak there in the in the early morning. Don't quite understand why why that is. Whether that's to do with change of uh, of nursing shifts or or something else, but that's uh, something to to e explore. And, and we we can see that uh, people from nursing homes account for about seven seven percent of uh, people being uh, taken to the emergency department uh, with seizures. And over the course of time, we see that that is steadily increasing, as is uh, uh, calls for the uh, for the general population. There are, there are a number of similarities between uh, people in the general population and, and people from uh, nursing homes uh, uh, attending the emergency department, but, but people from nursing homes are more likely to be uh, conveyed to hospital. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because often nursing homes have got nurses and, and healthcare professionals in place, and you think that they might actually be uh, be uh, uh, better able to, to manage people in, in the nursing home rather than um, sending them off in an ambulance to the uh, to the emergency department but we also see that um, nursing homes with a nurse a registered nurses in place are more likely to uh, have patient uh, call an ambulance uh, and for that ambulance to take patients to the emergency uh, department 
And that seems counterintuitive, but it could be that the nurse is actually managing the simpler cases and the ambulance is being called for the more challenging cases, which is why they're more likely to be taken to the emergency department. And we need to address and uh, and understand that because clearly the, the type of staffing in the in the nursing homes is going to influence the, the clientele in the nursing in the nursing homes, but it's also influencing whether people are taken to the emergency department and, and how much resources uh, being being spent. So next steps are around uh, finalizing uh, the project, writing writing up some reports, and and thinking about how we how we then move on to 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 a bigger program of work. Because clearly we've got a got a got a massive population in nursing homes, and seizures are a very common uh, problem, particularly as people are, are dementing, and we need better ways of of, of managing this in, in a safer and more efficient way for the health service. Okay, so hopefully that does justice to uh, Alan's slides, and of course I'm more than happy to to chat over over lunch uh, or later later today about what you've heard. I'll hand back to Pete. I think. Uh, cheers, thanks, Tony. And I, um, I think that's really uh, interesting that one of our public advisors, uh, sort of like from their own lived experience, came up with a, an idea for a potential project, and, and you know we've managed to secure funding and, and run with it for the pilot, and hopefully for a for a for a bit more uh uh you know for a for a for a more in-depth study so uh finally moving on we shall come to our other public advisor uh co-lead who is alan griffiths and he will be talking to you about the dynerix project so he can explain what the the acronym means <laughs> we're, we're trying to avoid death by acronyms but you just can't help it within the arc applied research collaboration um right so there you go are you going to work that for yeah, me? Tell me when you're going next. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Dynerics or Dynerics, whichever you prefer. People use both. Um, artificial intelligence for dynamic prescribing, optimization, and care integration in multimorbidity or Dynerics. It's, it's obvious, isn't it? Um, I don't know how they came up with that. It was before I got involved with the uh, with the project, but anyway, that is what it is. Uh, next one, please, sir. Right. Oh, I'll come on to that one in a minute. They, they actually, there's an in-between, uh, and that is transforming medicines optimization in multimorbidity through AIs. I have slight apology for using the word multimorbidity. The project actually was, I would say, launched. I think it was first thought of three or four years ago when multimorbidity was the common name for what is now multiple long-term conditions. Um, and unfortunately, because they use that, I think, in the application for the funding, they still have to, although it's it's considered now to be a little bit um, uh, not very nice word, shall we say. And speaking as somebody who has multiple long-term conditions, I can see where I can, I can see the point. Now, this is quite a complicated slide, as you can see. So I scribbled myself some notes to actually, uh, um, so as I could, I could read it. Um, so the aim of the project is to develop new tools to support decision making about medication um, for people with multiple long term conditions. For example, AI systems designed to identify patterns of conditions, medications, tests and clinical contacts preceding adverse events in order to identify individuals who might benefit most from a structured medical review. Now, you you probably think, does anybody here have regular uh, repeat prescriptions for any anything? Yeah, you'll probably see, I think if it's the same as mine, on the very top left-hand corner, it says date of next structural review. I've never had a structural review. You're shaking your head as well. They don't actually happen. Um, and I'll come to why they don't actually happen in, in, in just a minute. But... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, one of the first things I was asked in the project, could I try and recruit some people, uh, and one of three uh, groups who had had structural reviews. I couldn't find a single person who had. So that in itself has become a bit of a problem with regards to collecting data and so on and so forth. Um, I'll come back to that one. So the Dynamix Collaborative brings patients, clinic, clinicians, data, artificial intelligence, 
together to address the major problems of polypharmacy regarding people with multiple long-term conditions. Any mathematicians in the room? No, good. So nobody's going to query what I'm about to say. <laughs> so yesterday I decided I would Google how many combinations of 10 there are because the definition um, that, that is being used for um, people with multi multiple long-term conditions in the case of this project is that they have at least four conditions and they are on at least 10 different medications. The combination of 10 medications, according to Google, is three point, oh, just over 3.6 million combinations. Now imagine if you're a doctor or a pharmacist and you've been asked um, to do a proper review of someone who's on that medications, there's very little chance of you succeeding, I think, in completing that. However, with artificial intelligence, you could probably complete it in a matter of seconds, if not even quicker as long as the data is there. And this is the important thing about this particular project, and I do go on about it, I have to be honest, and that it's important that the people really understand that you, uh, I'm looking over there at Sarah, you can't really have AI without good data. Wouldn't that be correct? Yes. Yeah. Pardon? Absolutely. Um, now, in the first, oh, I'll go back to the work packages first, and I'll come back to work packages. All right, there are six work packages. They are all written over there. Well, five of the six are written over there, but you can't see them. Did you write them here again? No, it's all right, I did. Uh, work package one, requirements for well-informed implemented medicines reviews. So what we did for work package one, and this is where I was asked uh, if I could get um, a PAs to, to come along. Right, one group, older pe people with sorry, older people, and I think they mean over 75, with frailty. That was actually led by Leeds University. They did that part. The second one, people with mental and physical health conditions, um, which I helped to pull together those people, and people with four or more long-term health conditions and taking 10 or more medications, and I also helped to pull that group together. Two other groups they added to that because, I think, um, of the problem we had finding people who actually had had structural um, reviews. So GPs, that a group of GPs and a group of pharmacists, in both cases, they said that the problem is time. They just do not have time to do structural reviews. It's just totally, you know, a GP has 10 minutes per patient, I think. Um, you couldn't possibly do a structural review in that time. So, that became quite an issue. Um, work package two, oh, and by the way, that uh, a preliminary report of work package one is currently being written, and I'm not quite sure exactly when it's gonna be out, but it won't be very long. I've seen it without the um, old age people and frailty part, because say, that was done by Leeds University and still has to be added, or is being added into the report as I speak. Work package two, structural clinical data and narrative processing. Now, I'm an ordinary human being. I don't a clue what that means. Sarah told me earlier I what it means. It's about natural language processing. So when the doctors in their terrible handwriting stereotypically, they, they, they type it into the computer and they write, Mrs. Jones or Mr. Parkinson has to take three of these once, twice a day or something like that. They write the free text in and that is the um, bit that's processed uh, and they extract. Uh, yeah, they, they extract the work. meaning. <laughs> they extract the meaning from, from the, um, the free text. So it's about, again, it's, it's very much about data. As is the next one, statistical learning and clustering for multimorbidity prediction. That's getting the data together and starting to work on it and, and, and so that you can um, start predicting the sort of thing that we need to know in the end for the AI, I think. Um, well, page four, combine, combined longitudinal data visualization for medication reviews. Longitudinal visit. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, uh, 
some some kind of graph that will enable the pharmacists to be able to more quickly see which patients need to be prioritized for the medicine reviews. So they're going to use artificial intelligence in that as well, apparently. Um, there's a nice quote on online on the Dynarics about page from Lauren, who, who's telling me that. So that, that, that's how I know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. No worries. Number five, prescriber feedback and learning system. So that, I think, is when the prescribers, that's when they're going to start feeding back into the thing about how to go forward onto the final bit. And then we've got work packet six, which isn't up here, PPI strategy. Now, that has yet to be developed, and that is something we're going to get straight down to doing uh, after Christmas. We've got a new um, person who's just been employed. Four times they had to advertise the post, and so eventually they got somebody um, who is going to work with me on the PPI. Incidentally, I don't know if there are any public advisors here, but we will be advertising for more public advisors um, probably after Christmas now. Uh, with a view to working uh, or rather developing a strategy for PPIE going forward. Still another couple of years to go with this project, by the way. It's, it's, I know it's a couple of years old, but we're still very, very at the, at the, at the front end. Um, one problem that they've had, and again, hopefully you might be able to answer this question. Apparently CPRD data is not yet available. Why would that be? Yeah, so the CPRD data is one of these big data banks that I think it's about 5% of the GP data is included in this clinical research practice database. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> so we have to apply to use this data and you have to sign up for a project and uh, it takes them a while to provide the data back to the researchers, depending on if you have a more complicated query, then it will take longer. And my, my colleague, Pieta Schofield, who is also on the Dynarics project, is an expert on the CPRD data. So I'm sure she's helping you along with, with that. But, but sometimes there are unnecessary quite lengthy delays unfortunately at this time i think two of those working groups we, we had a, a meeting yesterday and two of the working groups are almost at the point i think whereby it's gonna unless that data becomes available very soon it's going to slow them down which is a little which is very unfortunate but you can't have ai without good data it's just it, it just doesn't make sense does it it's guesswork otherwise so uh, and, and that's why this is 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 really important. And the project itself is very important. He's looking at his watch. I better get sit down. Um, no apologies for the shirt, by the way. When I was told we were coming to witness rugby league club, I thought I'd best show you that I'm a Saints supporter. And um, uh, right, go on. Is another one? Oh, I'm not going to read that out. <laughs> but that's that, that's uh, all the people who are involved in the project. I think nearly anyway including somebody called um, Mark something, Professor Mark something, I can't remember his surname. <laughs> hey, thanks. So, so hopefully we're just giving you a flavour of some of the projects that um, the theme is, is involved with and especially uh, sort of a, a bit of a focus on the, the involvement of our, our public advisor, co-leads and public advisors in general. So what we're going to do now um, is we're going to have... Um, uh, a short presentation by Tony, as long as he's not sulking after being told he doesn't do enough structured medication reviews and you've got awful handwriting. Um, so if, you, if um, it's going to be on continuity and coordination of care and, and what data sets should we use. Tony's going to do a little bit of a um, talk about a potential project around uh, epilepsy service improvement within Merseyside. And then we're going to have a, a, a little workshop about data that we could use to, to help with projects like that. So, uh, Tony, there you are. Yeah, so so humour me. I'm going to talk about epilepsy again, which I, I realise arcs much more than uh, than epilepsy. But but just think about the epilepsy here as uh, as an uh, as an exemplar. We, we did we did pivot quite uh, quickly. Uh, we were going to have a session on uh, digital social care, but unfortunately the digital social care team couldn't uh, couldn't make it. So so we we thought it'd be an opportunity to to get some feedback about how we should be cope, uh, how we should be thinking about use of data for. Uh, uh, getting a better idea about how well care is uh, coordinated and delivered, which, which is one of the priorities for, for our theme. And, and Alan's just highlighted a really large, complex project trying to 
and maximize the, the use of uh, our data intelligently to try and tackle some really challenging health problems around multiple long-term uh, conditions. So, so I spent, I spend half to a third of my life in, in, in this place, the Walton Center, and, and we, we have a big, a big epilepsy service. So, so our, our epilepsy service uh, has about 12,000 people in it. And we have a number of consultants, specialist nurses, and other health professionals. Uh, and we, we do stuff ranging from first seizures through to complex brain surgery for, for, for people with, with epilepsy. So it's really quite a, quite a, a complicated, uh, complicated service. And, and we've, we've got concerns about how well care is generally coordinated in, in our system and, and the fact that epilepsy is a condition where uh, people can be affected at any point in their life and, and there is overlap with many different services and, and how well is care being coordinated for people with uh, with epilepsy and we're also very keen to develop a single point of access and I'll going to talk about that in a moment because the, 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 the way that people can access our service and get sensible advice and consistent advice isn't quite there yet and we're really keen to improve the, the efficiency and the quality of the care that we are uh, uh, providing. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna gallop along because I'm aware that we we need to uh, uh, have, have some time for you to talk. Because I think you talking to each other is the most fun bit of these uh, these sessions. So are we a highly functioning network at the moment? We're not, and and clearly the, what we've got here is Walton in in the middle with 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 an epilepsy, but that could be diabetes, or it could be asthma, or it could be many uh, many conditions. But we. We tend to focus often on conditions uh, on clinics which which uh, deliver care to people with specific conditions, and, and we might deliver that care in a. I was just trying to work out if there's a pointer here. There's, uh, we might deliver that care in a specialist specialist centre, but when people have an asthma attack or a diabetes goes out of control or they're they're having seizures, they're not going to come and see the specialist in the specialist centre. They're going to end up in the emergency department. So how well are we integrated with the emergency departments? We've done our national audits in the UK and uh, internationally, which tell us actually we've got a lot of work to do to better improve the delivery of care. It cuts across paediatrics and obstetrics. Obstetrics, really big worry. I don't know whether you've heard any of the news about sodium valparate, which is which has re-emerged again. And we're, we're trying to work out as a system how we how we deal with, with valparate, both across neurology and psychiatry. People with epilepsy in long-term conditions, they go and see their GP. They might be in nursing homes, as we've just discovered. We've also got a big cohort of people with learned disability and people with mental health problems. So how well are we integrated with psychiatry? We've got issues around capacity and demand. You know, we've, got, we've all got long waiting lists. So how do, how do we improve the efficiency of all this lot so that we're actually seeing people at the point of time where we're actually most useful? You know, seeing people every six months or so rather than actually tackling uh, dealing with problems is uh, is maybe not ideal. We've got a massive problem with health inequalities. People that most need access to services are at least likely to, likely to get them. And we desperately need to intelligently use our, our data to, to better inform uh, how we're how we're managing people. And again, Alan's talked about a big, big program of work across Liverpool uh, and Glasgow that's that's going to focus on, on that. And, and and the other thing that, that we're, we're aware of, and I think this is probably relevant to, to other services, we, we need a single point of access. We need to much, much better manage the way that people interact with and contact our service when they run into problems and when they when they have a need. And of course, people might have, have a whole load of different problems that they might want to talk to somebody about. And the person that makes contact might be the patient, but it might be a carer or another health professional or somebody else, some other individual. At the moment, there's a whole range of different telephone numbers that they can phone. They could phone a secretary, they can phone a nurse, they can phone a patient access center, they might phone the place that's organizing the tests. And I'm sure there's a, there's a longer list here. And, and the outcome for, from that contact might be, might be a whole range of things. At the moment, we're, we've got a degree of chaos going on whereby we, we don't have consistent ways of contacting services, we don't have consistent advice, and we don't have consistent outcomes, which means that we have inefficiency in the way that things are being done. People aren't having the best outcomes and health service resources aren't being used as efficiently as, them, as they might be. And these are really fundamentally important. We, we can we can spend. I spend a lot of time trying to work out what are the genes and the, and the, the biological processes which which result in, in, in epilepsy. But if we can't get these things right, how on earth are we going to improve the quality of life and the care for people with long term conditions? Really important that we 
address these problems. So I hand back to, yes. to you, Pete. Thanks, Tony. So that's just an overview of, of the issues around epilepsy um, sort of service development in, in uh, Chester and Merseyside. And we're currently applying for funding from a, um, a drug company who's got part of the money available to help um, to help look at that and, and improve that. And so we're going to have a little workshop now. So what we, we're saying is thinking about how we can measure the success or otherwise of projects concerned with continuity and coordination of care and, and principally uh, three questions, which are what data sets can be used to measure this and not, not necessarily just medical, but, you know, there may be other data sets. Um, what variables or, or information, if you, if you prefer, would be important measures of success? And what data should we look to collect on patients to be able to ensure the effects on health inequalities are captured? Because as we know, Arc Northwest Coast uh, has a, a, an overarching uh, focus around uh, health inequalities. Um, but, big but there in, in red. So we've used epilepsy just as, as an example, as Tony's obviously got an interest in it. And just for um, complete transparency, I'm a trustee of the Mersey Region Epilepsy Association. And um, so we've, we've used that as an example because we've got this application under underway. Um, but when taking part in your discussions, think about other conditions that you may have experience of. So what we propose is there's around about, if my maths is correct, around about 30 people in the room. I, I was thinking if we could have people on five tables of roughly equal groups to discuss these questions in each turn around about sort of 10 minutes on each question then we just ask you to write down some of your ideas on the post-it notes we'll collect those at the end um and we'll give you a form to fill in later if you if you want to be kept up to date on this online we have uh our researcher palavi deshpande is is hopefully going to be able to um facilitate the online discussion we can bring them in so if we just do about 10 minutes on each question then we just get, ask each table for a bit of feedback on each of those and um, so if we could get roughly equal numbers on tables that would be great and the facilitators are tony uh sarah ollie alan and possibly myself or sandra if she's recovered from a cough hopefully she has and um, so if you just want to move around and i'll just put each question up there and if the facilitators want to yeah so just move yourselves around and um have a talk around amongst yourselves okay i think we're just gonna sorry to interrupt but i think uh, we just so we can hear a few feedback points from each table and then we can ensure that you get to lunch on time and have enough time to see and go on the bus or whatever you want to do so um if I could just ask each table just to feed back on a, on a couple of points, and I'm going to take the microphone over, and I'm going to start with Sarah's table, if that's okay. So we started by identifying routes, uh, counting the number of previous appointments people had been to. To We had some orthotists orthos orthotist at our table, <laughs> and they were saying often they, they have um, people arrive with them, and they're quite upset because they've already been to see x y and z before they get to to them so it was like counting the the number and maybe the the journey that the patient has had to get to them and um, we decided that it would be really helpful to have um people empowered to navigate the system more quickly as well and we talked also about the burden of the journey through all the knockbacks that they get and how we could somehow measure that. Um, perhaps in the olden days, we used to have one GP that was sort of the keeper of the patient's story. But now we have um, a suggestion that we actually capture their therapeutic narrative, uh, which is captured to... to sort of help the patient transfer their story when they go to a new clinician so they don't have to start from scratch again and tell it all if it's a long story. Um, so that's for transferring between services. So um, it was mostly then about um, chatbots we got onto and, and talking about AI as well and about how we could possibly interact with those and it might be useful to capture some of that data as well and help people that didn't want to personally tell the story but they wanted to just write it down cheers anything else yep yeah, i think cheers mostly. thank you okay. um if you could pass the you have to pass it backwards to rugby league um, um to to ollie if, if, if possible 
Thanks. Cheers, Ollie. Just one or two points. Up. Sure. Cheers. Um, so we spoke quite a bit about health inequalities and um, how we can measure those at source, you know, a better understanding of perhaps household makeup, income, that sort of stuff in, in the source of data, um, understanding about the time from things like initial GP appointments to when people get to see specialists a bit more. Um, what else have we got? Do you want to talk about the discrete choice experiment? Okay. So one thing I asked, do we have to use existing data or can we create new data? And based on the previous slide you had, I thought it it kind of resembled attributes of a discrete choice experiment. And I thought you could actually do an experiment to see what's sort of what's the problem where people go at the next stage and sort of obviously we will have lots of different outcomes and factors and it might be a very massive experiment but um yeah I thought you could do like a patient version it will be upstream where do they land and you could do a, a healthcare professional version downstream um and how they make decisions or how they sort of like um that coordination of care um, so that might sort of inform the next steps in the data set where you kind of develop pathways or do uh, look at the data in diff diff yeah. a diff with a different lens, I don't know, to see um, what's the missing data in that continuity of care, where, where's the discontinuation, etc. Cheers. Thank you very much. Um, discrete choice experiments. The words just bring me out in a sweat. Um, I'll go across to Tony, if possible. Tony's table. Uh, don't know either yourself, Tony, or, or anyone else wants to just a couple of points. Yes. Yeah, so, so we have actually been doing some uh, discrete choice experiments to try and work out, out trade-offs between, you know, how, how, do you want to see somebody locally that's less experienced versus somebody who travel a long way, see somebody more experienced and, and, and so on to try and influence the coordination of services anyway we, we realized very quickly that we'd put the questions in the wrong order because we need to know what 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 uh, uh what the what the outcomes were before we could uh, uh think about what the what the data are um i've scribbled on some uh uh post-its here so, so um clearly this is my interpretation of what we talked about but I, we we, uh, we quickly cottoned on to the fact that we've got process versus uh patient outcomes which which uh which could be collected in, in, a, in a range of, of ways and and often uh health records don't collect the kind of the outcomes very well but but so process is often looked at as a surrogate with the assumption that um uh, uh, better patient outcomes flow we, we we thought the questions were really quite hard actually we we we, we wrestle with them and, and, and that's probably fair because we probably wouldn't be having a this, these conversations if it was easy we realize we need we need uh, to be thinking about patient trajectories from diagnosis through to chronic illness and also the fact that conditions fluctuate we agree that we need to be thinking about accessibility and interconnectedness but struggle to work out really how we might define and measure interconnectedness but it's but it's really uh, really vital we could measure some simple things like time to death and time to time to appointments which we've already got some experience of and they might be surrogates for for broader aspects of care and patient experience really important and how do we go about managing that and we also discussed the fact there are lots of apps evolving but they're not really well integrated with routine care so they're kind of almost happening in a in a parallel universe yeah. and th those data are really not being used or accessed Cheers. Thank you. And finally, the last table in the room, Alan's table, if someone can, oh, that's definitely not allowed. Cheers. Thanks. Just, just one or two key points, Alan, just so we can keep the time. That's great. Oh, okay. Well, firstly, I mean, we went through the, the, the obvious, if you, if you will, and that is you're asking about what sort of data, um, you know, primary care data, secondary care data, social care data, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't know how long or it, it's the, the the government had been trying. I mean, it's one government department, is it not? Department of Health and Social Care. Can they not get together and decide on one lot of data so that you lot don't have to look up hundreds of different types to in order to put it together? My son is one of Tony's, um, what do you call him? You're his consultant. So I don't know what the opposite of consult, consultee. Um, um, and I firmly believe in person-centered integrated care because it's about health and social care. And that's not just for people like him, but for people, lots of lots of people. Um, 
the third one, we, we talked about health inequalities. Um, Chesh, certainly Cheshire and Merseyside, and I don't know about the rest of the Northwest, but I imagine so, have adopted the Marmot Principles. Yep. Um, Marmot Principles are based on um, how, uh, social determinants. So it, it's all about how much you earn, where you live, uh, what sort of house you live in, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there's another, and that's fine, because that affects that sort of, uh, health inequalities affects all of us, really. But there's another one, a much more recent one, if you like, to be introduced, and that's called intersectionality. I said, well, I could do the for equity advert, but I look at the for equity website, um, and and you'll see a lot more in that about um, intersectionality, which includes, for example, things like you know, if you've got a, um, a learning disability, then your your, your life expectancy is 22 years less than if you don't. So, but that only affects like three percent of the population. So, but nevertheless, it things like that are become are growing and becoming more important. Can I just quickly hand over to my friend over here, who wants to just quickly talk about? You well, yeah. That was a, oh. just a remark about core outcome sets. I think wasn't it? Um, yeah. I just so finally, this is where I do my Rylan impression, and we pass over to our Walton jury. Can you hear us? Uh, Alavi, are you there? I am very yeah. much. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, more or less the same. GP records, hospital records, medications. Um, but one thing, one thing that was brought up was um, the patient should own their own data. So, for example, if they're traveling, they should be able to access their data to be able to give to the hospital in wh wh whichever city they're in. Um, so whatever data it may be, it should be held with the patient. Um, and that's, that's uh, more or less of what, what more or less what we talked about. Cheers, thank, thank you. Um, right, so thank you everyone for, we're just about on time. Uh, thanks everyone for taking part. Um, we're gonna collect these notes that you, you've made up here and we're gonna uh, collate them. If you are interested in hearing anything a bit more about this and, and the summary of the notes, then we have sheets here so you can fill in because otherwise GDPR, we're not allowed to contact you about them. But if you'd like to hear, then we've got some uh, sheets here. We've also got some pens. You can fill in your contact details. Thank you very much. Uh, for for attending and thank you to those online as well and just a reminder for the people in the uh venue here at witness we do have the clinical research network research bus which we'd love you to to visit at some point in the car i don't know i like blakey and um, so um yeah so there you go thank you very much and enjoy your lunch cheers <laughs>